Good evening, everyone. I'm very surprised to see so many people. And uh, I hope I don't chase you all away tonight, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, creation to restoration tonight. And as some of you might know, I was an atheist most of my life, a militant atheist. Uh, and we'll talk about how these people think and why they think that way. But uh, I'm no longer a militant atheist. I have been transformed into someone who actually believes in creation. But I'm not here to indoctrinate you tonight. I'm here to give you a choice to give you some things to think about so that you can make an informed choice. So, what are we going to talk about? A few years ago, in 2008, it was thought that the people in the world are not really informed on this issue. And there were people in the world, believe it or not, that actually believed that God created. Now, can you have such a silly idea in the world? You can't tolerate that. And so the, the powers that be decided to create a project which they called the Clergy Letter Project. And they sent out letters to the clergy. That's to all the, you know, the priestly people, telling them that we need to educate the public that everything came about by evolution. And they started off with an, an evolution day, then they expanded it to an evolution weekend, and then they made it even longer. And it was decided that uh, the pastors and the theologians had to sign that they were willing to spend one day a year or one weekend a year teaching the people in the churches about evolution. Now, I taught at a very big university in South Africa, and they had an organization there which was called Campus Crusade for Christ. Campus Crusade for Christ. And they made it their business to train the students as they came in to tell them that evolution is the only way. So when they came in, some of these students, they actually believed in God and they believed in creation. And when they left this program, which was Campus Crusade for Christ, over 80% of them no longer believed in creation. So they did a good job, right? Well, they had, in a very short time, they had thousands of signatures of pastors and theologians saying that they would support it. So in 2009, they changed it to an evolution weekend, and uh, they were going to preach to the people that they shouldn't be so misinformed, but that evolution was the only possible way. Now, you've all heard of Richard Dawkins, he is probably the spokesman for the evolutionary theory, a committed atheist, and he has an attitude which reminds him me of me. Uh, he gets very nasty when someone says, God did this or that or the following. And I had the very same mindset, so I understand the man, and I know where he's coming from, and I'm not here to shoot him down, I'm just telling you what his mindset was. And uh, he belongs to an organization which calls themselves the Brights, the intelligent ones. And in order to be a Bright, you must be an atheist. You must deny the existence of God. Then you're Bright. Obviously, if you believe in the existence of God and creation, then you're not so Bright, right? And he wrote this famous book, The God Delusion, where he doesn't have anything positive to say about God, and neither does he have anything positive to say about Jesus. And I think he uses every adjective in the book to describe the deities that he has been accustomed to. And uh, I shared his sentiments, and I believed like he believed. And I thought Christianity and religion in general was a joke. 
Now, let's have a look who belongs to the Brights. And this is rather interesting. This is their own web page. And you can be an atheist. That's logical. You can be a humanist or a secular humanist. That's sort of okay. But you can also be a pantheist or a Buddhist or a yogi or a Wiccan or a transhumanist. And you can still understand some of those issues. But then you can also belong to the Jewish faith, to the Catholic faith, to the Quakers, to the Episcopalians, which means Protestantism, and still be a bright. Now, excuse me, how can you call yourself a Christian, whether Catholic or Quaker or Episcopalian, how can you call yourself an atheist when you belong to those organizations? Well, the idea is very common today that you can have pastors who preach from the pulpit and they don't believe that God exists. And uh, we've had a couple of cases in my own country, in South Africa, where these issues came before the courts, because how can you be a pastor and not believe in God? But what these people do is they embrace the culture of, let's say, Christianity. They embrace the culture, but they don't embrace the doctrine. So they call themselves Christians. I think that's quite popular in Europe. You embrace particularly now with the problems in Europe, they want to embrace the culture of Christianity, but they don't want to embrace the doctrine that goes along with it. So these are the kinds of people, and they're very militant. So when they started out in 2008 with their uh, propaganda to tell people that there is no God, they put it onto the London buses with a slogan that there is no God there's probably no God. They wanted to actually say there is no God, but uh, they were forced by the Constitution to say there is probably no God, which is, of course, a bit of a misnomer. And they wanted to collect money for this project, and they were hoping to raise 5,500 pounds, but were surprised on the very first day to have gathered 36,000 pounds for this campaign. So, People are prepared to pay to change people's minds to the concept that there is no God. Now, Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis 1 31. Now, the popular thinking is that this must be an allegory. This must be some kind of mythology. And there must be some mistakes in it because it says it was very good. And nobody can deny that if you look at the world today, it's anything but very good. Would you agree? It's quite tumultuous and chaotic and anything but very good. And let's not even talk about six days. Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. And then it mentions all the animals on the, on the planet, you know, the, sea, the animals in the sea and in the air and on the earth. And then it says again, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him, male and female created them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, be multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion, and all of these wonderful things. So according to the scripture, humanity had a very noble origin. But according to science, humanity had a very ignoble origin. You came from the primordial soup, you progressed through the unicellular phases. Eventually, you became multicellular. You developed a, a ding on the one side. Eventually, a tube all the way through. And that's basically what you are, a bubble with a tube. It has its one opening in the, in, over here. It's called the mouth. And we'll leave the other one to your imagination. And that's what you are. And from that simple organism eventually all the organisms arose on the planet. Or so we are told. So we have two stories on origin. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 7 says, 
even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I formed him, yes, I have made him. So according to the scripture, there's this noble origin for humanity. And humanity had a purpose. It was there for the glory of God. Now what does that mean, the glory of God? Well, if you do a parallel studies, it'll turn out eventually, I'm not going to do it, that the glory has to do with the character of God. So man has a specific task of reflecting that image, the character of God. Well, he's not doing a very good job when I look at the news. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So the first diet that was prescribed to humanity, according to the scriptures, is a vegetarian diet. And it consisted of all the seed plants and fruits. There's no mention there of vegetables. But then it gets weird. Genesis 1.30 and also, and there's this big word there, every. Every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So according to the scriptures, the original diet of every single creature on the planet was plant-based. Correct? I mean, that's brain dead, wouldn't you agree? How can everything have been vegetarian. I mean, just look at a lion. Just look at a bird of prey. Just look at all the creatures eating other creatures, all the carnivorous creatures in the world. So this flies in the face of observation. And science is based on observation. So science has to be in conflict with what the scriptures say over here. So this brings us to Charles Darwin, who was a very intelligent man. He was also a fay in theology, as a trained theologian, and as a naturalist. And while he was traveling around the world, looking at the South American coast for mapping it, he was the naturalist on this boat, and he saw many things which brought him in conflict with his theological thinking. Not only that, he had with him a book written by a man called Charles Lyell, Principles of Geology, which argued for very long ages. So armed with these ideas, he was traveling around, and he wrote to his friend, Dr. Arza Gray, after having you know, presented his ideas. He said, I am bewildered. I had no intention to write atheistically. But I own that I cannot see so plainly as others do and as I should wish to do evidence for design and beneficence on all sides of us. You know, God said it's very good. But when I look around, I don't see very good. In fact, I see the opposite. That's what he's saying. He says, there seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichnomunidae, which is a category of parasites, with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that a cat should play with mice. I mean, here you read in the Bible about all these good things and all the animals were just eating plants and there was no death and everything was beautiful and honky-dory and perfect, and I don't see that. I see a cat killing a mouse. Does God think that's good? Very good. Does that look great? It's gory. And then it tortures the mouse and throws it around. And I'm thinking, he's thinking of lions, which are cats, catching other things. Little buck and little this and little antelopes and 
little pigs and what have you. I live in a wildlife estate, so I know what it's like. And I sometimes hear the leopard killing the animals and see things like that my whole life. And all these parasites that chew up things. And then he wrote in 1844, in the first draft of his Origin of Species, he wrote, it's derogatory that the creator of countless universes should have made by individual acts of his will the myriads of creeping parasites and worms which since the earliest dawn of life have swarmed over the land and in the depth of the ocean. So how dare you say that God created all of these things? But when we think of it in an evolutionary sense, well, things change. Then we cease to be astonished that a group of animals should have been transformed to lay their eggs in the bowels and flesh of other sensitive beings and some animals should live by and delight in cruelty, that animals should be led away by false instincts, that annually there should be an incalculable waste of pollen, eggs, and immature beings. When I look at the world from a biological perspective, with evolution in mind, then these things make sense. Now, does he have a point, yes or no? Be honest. Of course he has a point. Why do you think I was an evolutionist? <laughs> I was an evolutionist because he has a point. It's logic. Plain logic. Unless you're missing something. Maybe something changed. Maybe the world is not so perfect because something has changed. So let's look at that possibility. Does the Bible give a hint that something has changed? Well, it says, And Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. Here's something new. Because I was naked, there's something new. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you that you should not eat of? And he said, the woman you gave me, she's at fault. And the woman said, the serpent, he beguiled me. So the blame game started. And ever since then, we're stuck with this nonsense, right? But then something else happened. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? The woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust thou shalt eat the rest of thy life. Hmm. Can I assume that the serpent didn't go on its belly before this? Is it a possibility? So something changed, right? So maybe he didn't go on his belly, maybe he had legs. And uh, now something has changed. And if you're eating food and you don't have legs and you can't pick it up and it's in the dust, well, you're going to swallow dust. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, let's have a look at the animal kingdom. And these are uh, lizards with reduced legs. Now, these legs are actually perfect legs. They're just reduced. Here is another one with reduced legs, and here is another one with a tiny rudiment of legs. But the legs have not developed. And sometimes you find serpents that don't have legs at all that develop legs in the embryo, and then they disappear again. And sometimes something goes wrong in that development and they actually have legs even in adult phase although they're rudimentary legs. Question. If they have legs, do they have the genes for legs? Yes or no? Surely they must have the genes for legs. Okay. So why do the legs not develop normally? So obviously those genes have become masked. They are suppressed, so they don't become activated, and then the creature doesn't have legs. Now, my, uh, 
Charles Darwin knew nothing about genetics. Genetics wasn't around in his time. Mendel was busy doing something in his monastery, but nobody knew about it. So he knew nothing about genetics. He's just looking at the anatomy. And he's making conclusions by comparing one anatomy with another anatomy. It's called comparative anatomy. But he had no idea of genetics. So this creature quite possibly could have had fully developed legs at some stage. And evolutionists acknowledge that. They say, well, the legs got lost. But is this a gain of genetic material or is it a loss of genetic material? Or not even a loss, is it just a depression of genetic material? That is the question. Now, if it's not a gain, then it's not an evolutionary advance. Then it's actually an evolutionary regression. Are you with me? So it's not evolution in progress. It is the reverse. So let's take it a little bit further. What about uh, the serpent's poison? Well, it has fangs and it produces a poison, as do many creatures produce poison. Is this a new development that came about through evolution so that the creature would now be able to have the capacity to kill and harm other creatures and be able to consume them? Is this what happened? The answer is no. Again, there's no new genetic material here because the poison glands are transformed salivary glands. What happens if I would take the poison gland of a very poisonous snake and eat it? What would happen to me? Nothing. Quite right. Why? Because I would digest it. You see, the poison is a protein. And if I put that protein into my stomach, pepsin will break it apart, then trypsin will take it apart, and the exopeptidases will work through it, way through it, and eventually there would be no poison to attack me because I would digest it. But what if I take that protein and instead of putting it in my stomach, inject it into my vascular system, what will I experience then? a major reaction, immune reaction. I would attack that protein, and depending on the type of protein, my reaction will vary according to whatever has been injected. So if I take a simple thing like a salivary enzyme, and I eat it, nothing will happen to me. But if I take a simple thing like a salivary enzyme and I inject it into my body, there will be a major reaction. So this is not a new development. This is a new use for an existing object. The same with a spider. Exactly the same. You have spiders that actually live on pollen that they catch in their nets. And the, uh, the poison gland is the same as you have in a serpent. It is a transformed structure. Genesis 3.17, and Adam, and he said unto Adam, Because thou had hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now, this is rather an interesting statement. I don't know how much we should make about not listening to the voice of our wife. I don't know whether we should take that. I've tried that. It doesn't work very well. Have you noticed that? Okay. But notice that God doesn't say, cursed are you. He says, cursed is the ground. And why? For thy sake. I'm cursing the ground for your sake. So that you must eat of it with sorrow. And it's going to create problems for you. Number one, there will be thorns and thistles. Hmm. And you will eat your bread by the sweat of your brow. So the earth is cursed so that man becomes dependent upon God. Maybe he's now dependent on many issues. And... Uh, 
Today we need rain in the right season. We need the right temperature environments. We need this, we need that, we need the other. And if the conditions aren't right, well, it's amazing how many atheistic farmers start praying after a severe drought. Have you noticed that? So the earth is cursed, and it doesn't bring forth as it did before, for the sake of man. Now, what is a thorn? Well, you get various kinds of thorns. Here you have a desert plant, a succulent plant, and here in these desert plants, the stem has actually been transformed into the leaf. And the chlorophyll now occurs in the stem. And the leaf has become a thorn, a spine. Now, if all those spines were to develop into leaves, that would create a great surface area where evaporation could take place. And this plant would be in a very negative circumstance in a desert, for example. So, the thorns are actually transformed leaves. And it's very simple. The same gene that normally unwinds the leaf as it develops and opens up, winds it up until it becomes a spike. And therefore, there is no new genetic material. So this is not evolution. This is the different expression of the same genes. And today we know the science of epigenetics has taught us that the way in which the software controls the hardware of the genetic system often determines how something develops and what it finally looks like. And that's what makes for all this variety. But that's not the only way. In a rose, for example, you also have thorns, but here they are epidermal cortical outgrowths. Now, if you want an analogy, take a spade and start digging in your garden for a couple of days. What happens to your hand? You develop cortical outgrowths. You develop calluses, right? That's evolution, right? Within a week, right? No, it has nothing to do with evolution. It has to do with the stimulation of a particular spot which activates the gene system by, via the epigenetic system to produce more skin layers to protect you against what is happening. You're just asking the same genes to work harder. That's all you're doing. There's no new information, so it's not evolution. It's got nothing to do with evolution. And what is a thistle? Here's a thistle. Well, a thistle is just the petal that instead of unfolding genetically, dries up or folds in genetically, forming a spike. You can take trees that normally don't have thorns, plant them in a very hostile environment, like a high wind area, and the little branches with leaves will start getting stripped and they will make thorns. So the environment determines what the final anatomy will be. And it has nothing to do with evolution because there's no added new genetic material whatsoever. If I'm going to develop from an amoeba to an elephant, I need to add a lot of genetic material. The question is, where does that genetic material come from? And how does it develop? That's another lecture in itself. But let's just look at this thing. Darwin said, when he looks at the parasites, evolution makes sense to him. Because why would God create these creatures to go and feed on delicate bodies of other creatures? So obviously they evolved through an evolutionary process. Well, let's have a look at parasites. Parasites are generally reduced organisms. If you take the tapeworm, for example, here's a tapeworm. It doesn't have any eyes. It doesn't have an intestine. It doesn't need it. It's using yours. Why should it have an intestine? It's pretty dark in your intestine, so why would it need eyes? It doesn't have eyes. Uh, is there any gain of material here, or is there a loss? 
Have they gained eyes or have they lost eyes? They've lost eyes. They don't have an intestine. Is it a gain or is it a loss? Is it therefore evolution or is it devolution? Is it forward or is it backwards? All right. So can I use this as an argument for the evolutionary process? Can I say that this is evolution in progress? Well, let's have a look at bacteria, E. coli, or any other bacterium. We say that they evolve. Every year, there's a new strain of flu. Every year, there's a new bacterial infection. That's evolution in progress, so they say. Is it? Let's have a look how bacteria, for example, change. They have certain pieces of DNA which can jump across the barrier to the other party, and they're called plasmids. So plasmids are small DNA fragments, and they're known in almost all bacterial cells. And they carry between 2 and 30 genes, and some seem to have the ability to move in and out of the bacterial chromosome. So they get spliced out very precisely, and then they are transformed, transferred in a process from the donor. They go outside, and they go into a recipient, and then they're spliced into the DNA of the recipient, and the recipient then becomes a recombinant. Is that evolution, or is that swapping of genes? that already exist. And this organism now, the new one, the recombinant, has a totally different strategy available to it for dealing with certain issues. So things like acquired immunity, resistance to pesticides, resistance to herbicides, resistance to antibiotics is never based on new genetic material. It's only based on reorganized genetic material. Is that evolution? Is it something new that has developed? No, not necessarily. Now here's an interesting one. There are certain parasites which invade crabs. And uh, cyprids, for example, they invade crabs. And these eggs that you see belong to the parasite. So this creature enters into the crab and then it develops a whole lot of strands that grow into the crab and they confiscate all the metabolisms of the crab and develop the reproductive system which you see over there. So this ugly parasite consists of all these strands and these eggs. That's it. Nothing else. It's the ugliest thing under the sun. But when it is in the larval stage, when it is the larva, when these eggs hatch, it is a free-swimming organism. It has muscles, it has eyes, it has locomotory organs, it has an intestine, it has the whole gambit to make it an independent, free-swimming, living organism. Question. Does it have the genes for eyes? Must have, because the larva has them. Does it have the genes for muscles and locomotory t organs? Yes or no? Obviously, because the larva has it. Has it got the genes for a mouth and everything that goes along with feeding and metabolism? Absolutely. And then when it enters a host, it loses all of those and becomes this ugly, stranded organism that does nothing but produce eggs. Are those genes gone now? No. So what's happened to those genes? They've been switched off. They've been deactivated. And only genetic systems that develop the strands and the reproductive system are activated. So the entire organism has all the capacity to be a free-swimming, normal organism, but because of circumstances, whatever they are, competition, changed environment, it is convenient to invade a crab and confiscate its metabolism. Does that mean it had to be like that in the beginning, or could that organism have been totally free-living before? Just a question. 
Which brings me to this delightful creature, which is called the mosquito. Now, the mosquito, as you know, has this beautiful proboscis apparatus with which it can penetrate your skin and suck your blood. And it's not just a simple thing like that, because if you want to suck blood, you better take some precautions. Because blood has the capacity to coagulate. Now, you wouldn't like your straw to be filled with coagulated blood, because then sucking will become a very uh, difficult procedure. It'll be blocked, right? So there are enzymes which are produced which prevent clotting. Now, surely this is a major evolutionary advance where this creature has not only developed the apparatus for drilling through your skin, but also has the necessary enzyme systems to deal with the coagulation properties of your blood. That's a major evolutionary advance, except for one little thing, that only the female is a blood sucker. The male is a sweet, docile vegetarian. <laughs> now, I'm not sure whether there's a message in that, but uh, I don't want to get into any kind of uh, situation while I'm here, so let's just stick to the facts. So, the male sucks plant juice. Now, plant juice also has the capacity to coagulate because it has all kinds of proteins and tissues in it and stuff like pectins, etc. in it. That's why you can cook jam and it gets thick. That's why if you put uh, fig juice on you, it gets sticky, right? And the same enzymes that prevent the clotting will also prevent the coagulation of the plant substances. Question. Why does the female suck blood? Well, you see, she has a, a, an added burden. She has to produce eggs, and eggs require energy, lots of it. Now, what if the earth was cursed, and the plant didn't bring forth the particular plant that the animal was consuming, didn't bring forth in the same capacity as it did before? Would it then be necessary for the female who needed more energy to augment her diet, yes or no? Now, what could be more convenient than blood? Everything you need. All the nutrients that you require. What a wonderful source of nutrient. So, she utilizes it. Was she designed to utilize it in that fashion? Not necessarily, because the male doesn't need it, so there's no reason why she should have needed it. Is there any evolutionary advance here for this capability, or did they have it from the beginning? The same question you can ask about any insect that causes pain by injecting some form of venom into any other creature. And reactions vary. Now, most of those things that we find in wasps and in uh, bees are actually transformed ovipositors. So this structure here at the back that causes the pain is actually a transformed structure that actually used to do something else. And that's why some creatures, like bees, when they sting you, actually lose their sting, which is not a very good... Uh, evolutionary advance, and then they're stuck without it, and they die. So, here is the question. If this is a transformed ovipositor, then originally, maybe it did things differently. Now, if you take a worker bee, she doesn't lay eggs, and she's small, and she's a slave. She takes care of all the activities that have to take place in the hive. Does that little worker bee have the capacity to be a queen, yes or no? Absolutely. If the queen dies, what happens is that some of the workers start eating a different kind of food that's not normally available to them called royal jelly. 
And as they consume the royal jelly, guess what? They are transformed into queens. So does the worker bee have every gene that it takes to be a queen, yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. And what triggers it? Diet. Diet. So there must be components in the diet which attach themselves to the receptors on a histone protein round which the DNA is wrapped and unravels it and starts activating genes which are normally latent and inoperable in that creature. Is that evolution or is it deactivation and reactivation of ex existent gene patterns? Yes or no? It's not evolution. Well, have a look at something as simple as a caterpillar and a butterfly. I mean, you must agree they look very different, don't they? Does the caterpillar have every gene that it takes to be a butterfly? Yes or no? Obviously. Then why doesn't it look like a butterfly when it's a caterpillar? Because the genes for butterfly are deactivated. They're wrapped around his stones and they cannot be read. So you need certain environmental stimuli that the creature either develops himself as he embryologically develops or gets it in his environment because seasons sometimes change development. And then those histones are methylated and they unwrap and voila, you change into a butterfly. And the genes for caterpillar are then deactivated. The systems are highly complex, but let's get to Darwin's cat. And uh, let's talk about cats, big cats. Here's a lion. And if you look at this lion's skull, you can see these magnificent teeth. Surely this creature was designed to kill. I mean, why would it have teeth like that if it wasn't a carnivore? If it wasn't designed to kill? So, was God wrong when he said, this creature was a vegetarian? I mean, that's ludicrous, isn't it? Well, let's first look at uh, carnivory in general. Normally, a carnivorous animal in the wild is pretty aggressive. Have you ever been at the other side of a charging lion? It's a, it's a very humbling experience. And uh, you, know, you have to know how to deal with African animals. I mean, I've dealt with them a lot, and I know what this really means, and it really is true. When you meet a lion, and he's charging, you're walking in the field, and a lion charges you, what do you do? Run like crazy? You're dead. You're dead. You won't go 10 meters, and he will catch you when he's 100 meters away, before you go 10. You have no chance. And there are a lot of Europeans who are today dead, because they think they can get out of their car to get a better picture of a lion that's 100 meters away, and before they get back in their car, they're a meal. Just happens like that. You don't run. When a lion charges you, you look him straight in the eye. Like this. And he'll normally charge to almost in front of you, stop, and turn around. And then you have a lot of washing to do after that. But if you see a leopard, what do you do? You don't look him in the eye, because then you're dead. You don't. You pretend he's not there. And you sort of walk away, pray like crazy. You learn to be a non-atheist within a very short period of time. So aggression is a very important feature in carnivores. Now, there was a Russian scientist, Dmitry Baryev, and he did some interesting experiments with foxes. He took wild foxes, which are quite aggressive, and he raised litters. And out of the litter, he took the docile ones, and he propagated from the docile ones. And within eight generations, the aggression, the aggression was gone. They were like domestic dogs. So they would lie at your feet, climb on your lap, everything that a domestic dog would do. And what had changed? So he analyzed the adrenal glands and saw that the adrenal glands, the ones that produce the flight and fight mechanism hormones, 
were considerably larger in the wild ones than in the ones that were bred over eight generations. So can it be evolution? It's got nothing to do with evolution, right? Not in eight generations. And he also measured the serotonin levels in the brain. And lo and behold, the serotonin levels were much higher in the domesticated ones than in the wild ones. Now we know that low serotonin levels cause major havoc in modern society. And many people suffer from depression and uh, that manifests itself in many, many ways. It can either be that you become totally apathetic or it can be that you become highly aggressive. Many bipolar people vary from high aggression to no aggression. And this has to do with serotonin levels in the brain. And if you take certain drugs, like, uh, well, any one of them, the, the common drugs that people take, it lowers the serotonin levels. And schizophrenics have low serotonin levels. And it's interesting that the serotonin levels were massively different in the two groups of organisms. So all that it took was a hormonal change to change the aggression. Now here is a bear, and you can see a bear is classified as a carnivore because he also has these teeth, and he certainly is an opportunist, and he will kill, especially when he's grumpy. And when the snow melts and the salmon run is on, then he will consume fish like crazy. But 86% of his diet actually consists of plant foods. That's why he's called a bear, because he eats berries. That's why he gets the name bear. And the interesting thing is, 86% of his diet is berries. A large portion is fish, particularly during the salmon run. But the salmon run just lasts for a short while, and then it's gone. And then when the plants start growing again after the winter, and they bear their berries, etc., then he becomes a herbivore. He'll still be an opportunist carnivore. But if 86% of his diet consists of plants, is it possible that at some stage maybe 100% of his diet consisted of plants? What about the panda bear? The panda bear is classified as a carnivore based on his teeth. But how much of his diet consists of bamboo? 100%. That's what he eats. So if I had to take tooth structure to classify this creature, I would have to say he's a carnivore. And I can take any animal that eats plants, whether it falls in that category or not. This one, the koala bear, it's not a bear, but it eats eucalyptus, and eucalyptus has a, a drug in it which is anesthetizing. So it's a marvelous food because you spend most of your life sleeping. Now, here is a sign. This is the actual sign. I took a photograph of it. On the um, enclosure of the panda, the red panda in Australia, in the Sydney Zoo. And it says there on this enclosure's board, red pandas are classified as carnivores, meat eaters, uh, but uh, most of their diet is bamboo. Question. Does tooth structure necessarily dictate the diet, yes or no? Does it have to be a carnivore, a meat eater, because it has the teeth of a carnivore? Obviously not. Now, if you are going to eat bamboo, you would like teeth that can shred like a carnivore has. And we know, just from the paleontology, if we look at all the plants in the paleontological record, that today we have a fraction of the plant life that used to exist on this planet. A fraction. In the same way, we only have a fraction of the animals that used to exist on this planet. Whole categories are gone. Now, like reptiles, they don't exist today. 
Not at all. You have reptiles and you have mammals. You don't have any mammal-like reptiles. And in each of those categories, you have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of species that no longer exist today, that used to exist in the past. The same with plants. So if the planet was perfect in the past, and there was available to the animal all this plant life, then maybe the lion also ate something that was specific for it, that no longer exists. Now what happens to you if your food source, let's say your food source by argument, was grain? Whatever, wheat. And there's a crop failure, three years in a row, and there's no wheat. What are you going to do, die? Or what are you going to eat? Whatever. Whatever. You're going to eat what you can eat. Same with these creatures. If your original is no longer there, well, then you have to make a plan. So, lion, were you a vegetarian? Did you make a plan? Can you please explain it to me? Well, if I look at your anatomy, you look perfect for killing somebody. I mean, look at those muscles that you have. And look at that arrogant air that you have. Or what were you? Were you a vegetarian? The Bible says you were. Look at those teeth. That's the tiger's tooth. Well, maybe you were not. What about you? Were you a vegetarian? What about you? Have you noticed something? This creature is pretty ugly. And he's a scavenger. And I've made a study of this, and I've, I've noticed that the further you get away from the original, the uglier you get. It's just amazing. Animals that are carnivores and are first-tier carnivores have a bearing on them. They still have something awe-inspiring. You go down one trophic level or the next trophic level, they get uglier and uglier and uglier. And uh, were you all vegetarians, all of you? This is unbelievable. Now, here is a bird of prey. And according to Scripture, how many birds uh, ate plant foods? Every bird. Every bird. Now, look at him. He's got the equipment to kill. And he's got the piercing eyes to search you out. And here you have a stealth bomber. You don't even hear him. He comes from behind. His feathers are so structured that you, he makes no sound. I mean, technology uses this to design the best airplanes in the world, the stealth bombers. All of these, these magnificent things have been schooled upon what you have here in nature. So what about these creatures? Were they vegetarian? Well, here's a parrot, and he's, he's a vegetarian. He has the talons to grab. So he could grab a mouse if he wanted to. And he has a beak that can certainly kill. Would he be able to take your finger off? Well, you can try. It's a very painful experience. I had a parrot. He used to copy me and say everything that I say. But if I stick my finger in there, he'll take a chunk out of my finger. But my wife, he loved her. He never bit her. I don't know. It's a very strange thing. Never bit my wife. Uh, can he kill with that mouth? Yes. I had a friend, he had a parrot. And uh, his parrot used to sit outside on his cage, on top of the cage. And whenever he came home in the evening or something, he would see dead birds around his cage. And he didn't know what was going on. And so he set up a system to see what his bird was doing. And this bird was bored. I mean, if you had to sit on a cage, you'd be bored too, right? He was bored. So he developed a little game. These, kings are, these things are clever. He used to take his bird seed in his mouth and then scatter it around him. And this would attract other birds. And the little birds would come and eat the seeds and he'd go and kill them. He wouldn't eat them, but he killed them. He can kill. Now, here's a New Zealand key parrot. And this little parrot eats the root of a particular tree. It has a succulent root, almost the consistency of a carrot. And the key parrot 
used to eat the succulent root. And then they developed in New Zealand uh, a housing development. And they ripped out all of these trees to replace it with domestic dwellings. And guess what? All of a sudden, there were dead sheep all over the place. Dead sheep. And they found out that this parrot would go and sit on the back of the sheep and cling to its wool, and with that sharp little beak, dig its way through the back until it got to the kidney, and then it would eat the fat around the kidney, and the sheep would be dead. Now, if you want to annoy a New Zealand farmer, you kill his sheep. So what did they do to solve the problem? They planted the trees. They replanted the trees, and guess what happened? The parrot went back to his original diet, digging up the root and eating the root. That's what he ate. So now, my question. Let's say that tree was struck by some disease and disappeared off the island. And Charles Darwin arrives, and he sees the New Zealand key parrot killing animals. What would he say? He would say, well, this creature is evolutionary developed in order to kill. Look at that sharp beak with which it can rip open even the hard skin of a sheep and dig its way through to eat the fat around the kidney. Why the fat around the kidney? Why not the rest of the sheep? Did the animal know that there was food around the kidney? No, but it must have sat there or frustrated or something, and this is how it developed. And then it found that food source, and they all developed it. But when the original diet came back, it went back to its original diet. Is this evolution, or is this a change of circumstances which necessitated a change of diet? It's got nothing to do with evolution. If I look at the piranha, it eats meat. If I look at its closest relative, the paku, with which it can breed, it's that close. This one eats only seeds, and this one eats meat. And under certain circumstances, this one will also eat seeds. But the circumstances are thus, that if they both want to survive, one has to give up his diet and eat something else. What about chipmunks? What do they eat? They eat seeds. Haven't you watched Chip and Dale and Walt Disney? They're always collecting nuts, right? They eat seeds. And nowadays, with the forest destruction and the fires in the forests and the acid rain in the forests, there isn't enough food. So these creatures are eating roadkill. In other words, animals that have been run over or animals that have died. That's what they're eating. They've become scavenger carnivorous scavengers. If you saw that today, you would think that that's normal. But it's not normal. It's only normal under a cursed environment. Then it becomes normal. So when I look at animals like rodents that are all coprophagues, or horses that are all coprophagues, coprophagy is a nice word for eating your own excreta. That's not good, very good. That's disgusting, very disgusting. So why do these eat, creatures eat their own excreta? Why? Because they can only ferment the plant foods that they get in their cecum, which is at the end of their intestine. So to get the nutrients, they pass it through again to get it second time round. So a rabbit will produce two kinds of fecal material, one soft and one pellet, the pellet one is discarded, the other one is eaten directly off the anus. And the same with every rodent. Now, what if the plants that they are consuming don't actually provide what they originally used to provide, then the animal is necessitated to pass it through twice. Now, horses will coprophage. In other words, they will eat their droppings off the ground. But if you feed them high-quality food, like grains, mixed in with their diet, they don't coprophage. What does that tell you? Is that evolution? Or is that adaptability? So let's get back to the lion. Lion, 
Are you sure you were a vegetarian? Now, I didn't do experiments with lions, but I know that many, many lions have been raised on vegetarian diets. There were a couple of people that owned lions, and just recently one man was in the news. He was over 90 years old, and he had pet lions. He lived in Zimbabwe. And the one lion used to sleep with him on his bed, on the double bed. But the lion had a problem. He stank, and he had bad breath. And not only bad breath, but the other side produced horrendous odors as well. And so he was getting tired of this, and so he put his lion on a vegetarian diet, mainly of maize and legumes and things like that. And guess what? The lion's skin diseases went away. He no longer had bad breath, and the odor that pro was produced at the other side was not as noxious. And uh, you can do that experiment yourself. If you eat a lot of meat, then you have a lot of sulfur-containing amino acids in, your, in the protein that you are consuming. Then the bacteria in your colon will be sulfur-metabolizing bacteria, and they will produce hydrogen sulfide, which is what you call a stink bomb, right? And uh, that will be the consequence. Whereas, if you have plant proteins in your diet, and lots of carbohydrates and those issues associated with plants, then you will produce hydrogen metabolizing bacteria and you will produce methane. Now, methane can burn, so it's explosives. So I wouldn't strike a match in the process, but it's odorless. So that's just one of the things. But the interesting thing is this lion not only lost its skin diseases, it also lived twice as long as any of his other lions. So that was interesting. Now, I had a student who was doing a PhD under my supervision, and she was working on chickens. She was working on um, antibiotic resistance, and because the industry feeds animal protein to chickens, some industries, others feed only plants, we wanted to see which one would develop the greater antibiotic resistance. So there were chickens that were on a plant regime. There were chickens on a plant regime with antibiotics. There were chickens on an animal protein regime and an animal protein plus antibiotic regime. So we had a comparison between plant protein and animal protein in chicken. Now the reason why I was interested in that it's because I gave a lecture once in the United States and one of the scientists was very angry. Uh, they get very angry about these lectures. And they said, the teeth don't determine whether the animal is a carnivore alone. A lion has a much shorter gut than another creature, than a herbivore. And in fact, carnivores have short guts. And that's true. The gut of a carnivore is on average six times the length of the trunk whereas the gut of a herbivore can be up to 22 times the length of the trunk. So surely that took many millions of years of evolution to reduce the gut down to just six times the length? Or did it? And I said, no, that's epigenetics. It can happen very quickly. And he said, nonsense. And so when I got home from my tour, I had this student working on this, and I said to her, she was a, a lady student, I said to her, when you finished your experiment, I want you to compare the gut length of those chickens that got plant food only with those that got animal food. So I want you to unravel it and put it down and measure the length and a whole lot of other parameters. She said, no, that's disgusting. She's not going to do it. And I said, that's fine. You don't get your PhD. <laughs> so she did it. So these are the diets. We don't have to go into the details. The one had a plant protein diet. The other one had an animal protein diet, but the proteins were absolutely the same, the, the levels in the end. And let's have a look at these groups. A is plant protein alone. B is plant protein, the same diet, plus an antibiotic cocktail to measure the antibiotic resistance later. C was the animal protein, and D was the animal protein, same diet with the 
antibiotic cocktail. And we looked at caucus yield, not much of a difference, no big deal, statistically not significant. So they grew well whether they got plant food or whether they got animal food, made no difference. When it comes to gut mass, it's interesting that those that got only plant food had the, the heaviest gut, but that's not a parameter that's very useful. If an antibiotic was added, the gut mass decreased. If animal protein was given, it was still less, and so there was a trend, but it wasn't significant. Then gut length. Interesting. This is six weeks, six weeks of growth, from the hatching to six weeks. If it got plant food, the longest gut. You add an antibiotic, the gut gets shorter. You add animal protein, the gut gets shorter. You add an antibiotic to that, gut gets shorter. So can what you eat affect the length of your gut, yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. But here's another interesting one. Heart mass. When they got plant food or animal food, the heart was compact. When we added antibiotics, the heart became enlarged and weaker. That's fascinating. Do you know how many young people suffer from cardiovascular disease these days, which was unheard of in the old days? Didn't happen to that extent? Is it possible that something that you add to your nutritional regime can affect the development of your anatomy? Yes or no? Is that evolution in six weeks? It's got nothing to do with evolution. So what you eat affects what you are. Liver mass. If we added antibiotics, the livers were enlarged, whether you got animal protein or whether you got plant protein. Here is an article in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. A high ratio of dietary animal to vegetable protein increases the rate of bone loss and the risk of fracture in postmenopausal women. And they had nearly four times the risk of fracture if they took animal protein as opposed to plant protein. So my question is, excuse me, are we designed for animal protein or are we designed for plant protein? Now, when I started off my research, I started the research comparing plant protein and animal protein. And we applied for funding from the government, from the funding organizations, you know, the scientific organizations. And they said to me, you're not going to get any funding. And I said, why not? And they said, because a protein is a protein is a protein. This is a silly thing that you want to do. And I said, no, a protein is not a protein is not a protein is not a protein. Because a plant protein looks totally different in its amino acid composition to an animal protein. The same amino acids are there, but the ratios are different. There are more branch-chained amino acids in a plant protein than in an animal protein. There are fewer sulfur-containing amino acids in a plant protein than in an animal protein. It does make a difference. They said, we don't care. You're not getting any money. So I said, okay, I'll use my own money. I'll use my own money. And when we got the first results, suddenly we were funded. And suddenly the world got interested. And suddenly I had exchanged students with Harvard University and Oxford University and the thing was going like wildfire. And everybody was saying, whoa, what's going on here? And we did one experiment with sheep. Now this was interesting because I heard a lecture by someone and he was explaining that sheep that are fed in a stall, in other words, they don't run around free, that they tend to develop skew legs. And I asked the question, what diet are you feeding them? And I said, well, what the industry feeds them. We feed them uh, alfalfa, lucerne, and we augment the diet with animal protein. So some use carcass meal, which is not so favorable anymore, but fish meal is very common still today. Fish meal they were using. I said, that's your problem. You're feeding them animal protein, and that's causing calcium loss. No, they said. So let's test it. So we took merino sheep that were just weaned. So they were little rams, just weaned. And we fed them different dietary regimes. 
So they got, the one group got to 12% protein diet, which is all plant-based. So it was alfalfa. So it was lucerne. That's what they got. That contains 12% protein. Then we took the exact same diet and added 3% animal protein in the form of fish meal. That brought it up to 15% protein diet. We took another group and we added 5%. We took another group and we added 8%. That brought it to 20% protein. And then we took another group, we took the same basic plant one, and we added 8% plant protein in the form of wheat gluten. So 20% protein, all of it plant, 20% protein, of which 8% is animal protein. And then we let them grow, and we compared. And what was the result? Here is the days, and you can see it's rather quick. 20 days, not even a month, you could start seeing a difference. When we added animal protein, the legs tended to go skew. And this is what they looked like. Here's one with beautiful straight legs. Here is one that's a 5% protein and 5% animal protein. You can see the deformity in the foot there. See a slight curvature on the leg. And there's an 8% one. He's a total disaster. In fact, he couldn't even get up. Can you see my colleague is picking him up? Look at those legs. They look horrendous. Now, you'll think that that is a cruel experiment, but I was just going into what they were doing anyway. And they go up to 36% protein. This was just 20% protein, of which only 8% was animal protein. So if you look at those legs, they look pretty deformed. But if you took an x-ray, they actually looked okay. But then we did some analysis. Calcium to phosphorus ratio. When we added, whether you took the cannon bone, whether you took a rib, whether you took a vertebra, it didn't matter. Same procedure. When you added animal protein, the ratio of calcium to phosphorus changed. Less calcium relative to phosphorus. So the structure changed. These are the 20% ones. Animal protein, 8% of this was animal protein. And you're looking here at calcium loss in the urine and the stool. You can see that if they got animal protein, they lost nearly four times as much calcium than when they got plant protein. And uh, calcium to phosphorus ratio, you can see, uh, oh, here's the calcium to phosphorus ratio. Pathetic if they got animal protein. Excellent if they got plant protein. Deformity, 50% is no deformity. So plant proteins were much, much better than animal proteins. Now, this is a fascinating one because here we did histology. So now you're looking at the, the structure, at the actual scaffolding of the bone. And uh, osteoid volume, this is 12% plant protein, plus 3%, plus 5%, plus 8% animal protein, plus 8% plant protein. Look at the plant proteins. They're excellent. But the bone volume went ding, ding, ding down. This one here is particularly interesting because here we took, we marked the bone by injecting the animal with a product. Wait 10 days. Inject him again. The bone absorbs this product. It's just an antibiotic, tetracycline. And you get two lines under fluorescent light. And you can see the bone development in exactly 10 days. So you cut out everything except 10 days. And this is what you get. Perfect bone structure when it has plant protein. Add 3% animal protein worse. Add 5% worse. Add 8% horrendous. Add 8% animal plant protein at least. Perfect. What was this animal designed for? Animal protein or plant protein? Plant protein. You'll tell me it's a sheep, you silly fellow. Of course, it's plant protein. You repeat this experiment with a dog, with a cat, with a pig. Guess what? Same result. Same result. They weren't designed for animal protein. Now here is a monkey. 
and we'll ask him to open his mouth and you can see that he has a pair of incisors that would make a lion proud. Would you agree? And yet he's a vegetarian. So again, I want to remind you that tooth structure has absolutely nothing to do with the original diet. Just for interest's sake, I threw in this slide of homology where you compare a human and a cat and a bat and a porpoise and a horse and they will tell you in the comparative anatomy class that these animals are all related because they have similar structures. But the problem is this. This is uh, Fix. He made this study. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to explain it. He says basically that if, if these things are related, then they must be coded for by the same genes, more or less. Changed over time, over millions of years, to slightly differ, but still have enough commonality to look similar. But unfortunately, the genes that develop the legs of a horse and the genes that develop the legs of a human being are on totally different chromosomes, totally different gene, genes, not even the same genes. So they cannot be related at all. There is no evolution genetically visible. So look at the animal world and the plant world. And you ask yourself the question, is it possible that things were different in the past? Is it possible that at some stage it was good, very good? Well, look at things like beauty. Do you have to be beautiful and symmetrical in order to propagate, in order to bring forth children? Do you have to be beautiful? If a dog is on heat, does the pedigree beautiful creature care two hoots whether the pavement special is beautiful or not? Yes or no? No. Doesn't care two hoots. As long as he has a, she has a pheromone, that's it. That's all he needs. Beauty is not essential to propagation. Then why do you have symmetry? Why do you have color? Do you need color in order to propagate? Do horses see color? No. Horses are... Black and white, they see black and white. They don't see color. But here you have all of this beauty in the world. And you have these birds that look so magnificent. And here you have the sacred ibis, which is a beautiful bird. And that is his relative. Here is the bald-headed ibis. And here is the simple hadida. And these creatures are so closely related that they can pair with each other. And in fact, this halfway beautiful, ugly little thing is a cross between a sacred ibis and that ugly one that I showed you just now. So, what was it like originally? What was it like? Why, why do we see beauty? If we don't need it in order to propagate, do you have to necessarily smell good? Do you have to be able to use all of these senses in order to propagate? Remember, evolution says just that you have to be successful in producing offspring. Then why do you have all of these features? And has anybody ever thought in the evolutionary world what it entails to actually see what we see? It doesn't require just the development of the eye with its lens pattern and its uh, structure. That has to be transferred to a nerve stimulus, which is just a bunch of ions running up and down a strand. Then it has to be interpreted by the brain, and it has to make a picture which is stored forever. The complexity of it is mind-boggling. How did it come into existence? What about irreducible complexity? What about all of these issues? For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Old Testament. 
Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. New Testament. So both the Old and the New Testament says that this world is temporary. And then Romans tells us, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same to hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Scripture does not deny that this world is not perfect. And there is no reason to use the imperfection to say that the Bible is incorrect. Let's look at a prediction in Isaiah 11, 6 to 9. Future world. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Will there be aggression according to the text? No. In other words, the hormonal balance will be restored. That's all it is. It's a hormonal balance. Okay? And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion will be a vegetarian. That's what it says. You'll eat straw like the ox. Ludicrous statement. You had an original diet. You have a future diet. And then it says, the sucking child shall play at the hole of the ass. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den, in other words, the cobra. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. In other words, they will not use their anatomy to inflict damage any longer. The situation will return to what it was normally. Why? For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, I don't think this is what the Bible has in mind. But uh, this creature won't look like this anymore. I don't know what it will look like. But I can imagine that it can look very, very different. Do you know that in these creatures there are rudiments of structures which are unbelievable? I don't want to go into them because you'll say I'm mad. But there are rudiments which seem to indicate that this creature looked totally different in the past. And what about interacting with animals? Let's listen to this little tape. I mean, many of you have seen it, but it's quite cute, so let's look at it. Here's a man, and he's opening the cage to a lion. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Hello. Hello. My question is simply this. I'm not telling you that you must believe in creation. I'm not telling you that you must believe in evolution. I'm just asking a question. Is it possible that the animal kingdom was different in the past to what you see now? And is it possible that it could be one day restored to what it originally was? And if the answer to that after this lecture is yes, then perhaps you should open your minds to some other ideas that we read in the scriptures which might surprise us. And that's all I want to do. I want to invite you to free your mind to think of some other possibilities. And may the God that you believe in or not bless you anyway. Thank you.